Good evening and a very warm welcome to this evening's event. This is, of course, the launch of the FSRH International Strategy. And I'm sorry that we can't welcome you all to our offices in London, but instead we will be having some excellent speakers this evening um, here on Zoom. And it does mean that through Zoom, we can also host some of our speakers who are actually joining us from Botswana, which is really exciting. My name is Helen Monroe and I'm a consultant in sexual and reproductive health and I'm also the FSRH Vice President and of membership. There is going to be an opportunity for you to ask some questions so do use the chat function to be able to um, pose your questions and at the end of all the speakers there will be a Q&A session and hopefully we'll get through as many of those as possible. So let me introduce our first speaker to you this evening. It's Dr. Nikki Morgan. She's an associate specialist in SRH in Devon. She was the SAS lead for FSRH until 2019 and is now chair of the International Committee and the FSRH representative for the Bash Beaver Faculty Mentoring Scheme. Nikki's had a varied career, having trained in Birmingham, where she did a medical rotation before moving to Devon to pursue her interest in women's health and SRH. She's had an interest in global health for a long time, working in Eritrea and El Salvador, and in the past and is currently studying a master's in global health policy with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's been a trustee of a children and young people's charity called Educid since 2011, which aims to improve access to education for children in Uganda, Cambodia, and Palestine. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Helen. Um, and welcome everyone. I just wanted to uh, give everybody a, a short uh, introduction really to the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare, for those of you that are, are not aware of it. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about our international um, policies that are available and our um, uh, international strategy. So just share my screen. Okay. So the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare um, is a members organization, a, a professional um, organization for healthcare professionals interested in working in sexual and reproductive health care and actually I think we are one of the few organizations that is specifically uh, involved in sexual reproductive health care uh, and we you know, that's all we concentrate on. Um, we were established in 1993 and we're a relatively small organization with 15,000 members um, but we have many of the functions of, of a medical royal college. Uh, we are affiliated to the Royal College of Obs and Gynae uh, and we share a, a building with them uh, in Union Street in London, but we have a separate governance system um, and we are cross speciality um, with uh, many different different uh, clinicians from different specialities are, are part of our membership and we are multidisciplinary as well. And our vision really is to provide high quality sexual and reproductive health care at every stage of, of people's lives. So we take a whole life course approach um, and really to, to enable this to happen, we see three key areas um, that, uh, of our work. That's involved with skill, skilling up our healthcare professionals with education and training, standards and guidance, um, providing evidence-based advocacy um, uh, to inform policy and uh, raising public awareness of the importance of sex and reproductive health care. And what we really want to do is embed good, uh, high quality sex and reproductive health care within our health system. So these are the qualifications that we offer to our um, uh, UK audience and uh, we these are all housed on our training hub. Um, we also offer clinical guidance uh, and standards which are evidence-based and regularly updated um, by our clinical effectiveness unit. Um, and we provide a, a journal, the SRH journal, which is part of the BMJ um, partnership. 
Uh, we also have conferences and events. And of course, with COVID, um, the, these have been more and more online. Um, and I think in the future, we will probably have more of a hybrid type model, which of course makes this accept, accept accessible to an international audience. So this is our governance structure. Um, we have a, a board of trustees because we are a charity um, and council feeds into that board of trustees. And then as you can see uh, along the bottom there, that there's a whole list of uh, committees that uh, report into council and international committee there is circled in red. Um, but really our international work uh, uh, crosses all areas of, of the, the faculty. Um, and uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the specific uh, resources that we have developed um, for a, a more international audience. So the contraceptive counselling course uh, is a course that was developed uh, by the International Committee with funding from the European Society of Contraception. Uh, and this is really aimed to be uh, context neutral, so it, it should be applicable to, to anywhere in the world. Um, and it really um, picks up on the fact that any consultation to do with contraception is to do is, is associated with sex. It's talking about sex and, and the stigma and the embarrassment some people may feel about talking about sex. Um, and, you know, recognizes that some healthcare professionals as well as some patients are not altogether comfortable with that. Um, and it looks at different case scenarios, um, it has video content, additional learning resources, um, and it talks about how to address, um, uh, how to convey risk, um, how to address myths and misconceptions. Um, for example, one of the case studies that, that it talks about is a, a young adolescent, young woman who goes to a healthcare professional um, asking for, um, she wants to ask for contraception, but she turns up talking about her, her sore throat. And it's, you know, ways to really uh, enable an effective uh, contraceptive consultation uh, to take place. Uh, people that enroll in this course also have access to an online um, peer community where they can talk about some of the scenarios in the course, talk about how they would approach them, uh, talk about best practice um, and share resources. Uh, and that's been really quite useful um, for people and, and uh, globally people have uh, contributed to that course. It is moderated by some UK clinicians uh, to sort of keep the conversation going. Um, and also we have the International Certificate of Knowledge, um, and this is really based on e-learning for our UK audience. And what the International Committee did was they, they took the e-learning and uh, tried to make it more um, adaptable for a, a global audience, which got anything particularly UK specific. Um, and we trialed it in Botswana, and you'll be hearing uh, more about that trial in, in a minute. Um, but they gave us really, as a result of that pilot, we had some excellent feedback um, and to how we could improve it. And uh, we've added extra resources um, and um, some more uh, uh, ex extra learning resources added as well. Um, and what we really want to do is try and encourage uh, clinicians to use the International Certificate of Knowledge uh, and to take that knowledge that they've got and uh, use the tools that we give in the resources to adapt that knowledge to their own individual um, environment. Um, so what are the strategy then? Our, our new strategy really has three prongs, um, knowledge exchange, system change and sustainability. Uh, the knowledge exchange is, is about the uh, training and learning uh, materials that we were offering, um, but we also recognize um, that, there's a, that there's a lot that we can learn um, from, uh, from other countries and the way other countries are uh, adapting, particularly uh, in this era of COVID-19, when access to sexual and reproductive health care has been um, affected globally. Um, and we've all had to um, adapt um, and uh, innovate in, in different ways. Um, we've been using uh, online for um, both teaching and training and for service delivery um, and people have you know new ways of working so we're keen to learn from others um, and to share our experiences and of course we're also keen to learn how we can adapt and improve our learning resources for a global um, uh, healthcare professionals 
Uh, we also want system change, and that's really looking at a right, taking a rights-based um, advocacy uh, for a local delivery of good, high-quality sexual reproductive health care, and we want to support partnerships um, to, to deliver that locally. Um, we also want to engage with um, uh, global networks of uh, sexual reproductive health care workers, organisations, um, and you know, use an online facility to again share ideas and experiences. But of course, these two prongs can't actually function without the third prong, which is sustainability. We are a, a relatively small organisation um, and most of our funding comes from our members. So we really need to um, either well, grow our international membership, which is particularly appropriate for high income countries. But if we are really going to uh, make our resources accessible for uh, low and middle income countries, we need to secure sources of funding through grants um, and, and through partnerships. Um, and this whole new strategy really has been um, informed by the Sustainable Development Goals and particularly uh, SDG 3, which looks at um, health and well-being and uh, SDG 5, which looks at gender equality. Um, so uh, there will be time for questions in the panel afterwards, but uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'll hand back to Helen to introduce some of our um, excellent speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. A wonderful start to this evening, just to get an overview of the work of uh, FSRH and also, of course, our new strategy. So I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, who um, is currently in Botswana. Unfortunately, her plans for coming back across the UK have been uh, delayed slightly. But it does mean that Chelsea Moroni, Dr Chelsea Moroni, has been able to uh, present to us this evening um, a little bit about her involvement with the International Certificate of Knowledge. If you don't know Chelsea, she's an SRH doctor and women's health epidemiologist. She's co-director of the FSRH Clinical Effectiveness Unit and a Chancellor Fellow and Reader in Global Sexual Reproductive Health at the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health at the University of Edinburgh. She's an Honorary Professor of Women's Health at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and she's lived and worked in South Africa since 1996, and latterly for the last eight years in Botswana. She founded and directs the Botswana Sexual and Reproductive Health Research Initiative and holds consultancies and senior advisor posts for the African Ministry of Health and the International AIDS Society and WHO. But she's still clinically active somehow, she manages to find time um, and she works for various government and NGO clinics and of course um, helps to head up the Chalmers Sexual Health Centre in Edinburgh. She's joined by Helena who is a doctor currently working in HIV medicine in London who completed a year-long clinical and research attachment in the Botswana Sexual and Reproductive Health uh, Research Initiative in 2019 and is starting academic training in general practice with a specialist interest in SRH. She's also joined by Nene, who is a nurse midwife with 19 years of experience and a special interest in SRH, currently working in the St. Joseph's Mission Clinic. She's previously the lead nurse of the Botswana Family Welfare Association, Botswana's IPPF and affiliate NGO. Anne Tyro, who is a nurse midwife passionate about SRH and human rights, He's been practicing since 2003 in various clinical settings and is currently the cervical cancer program lead for Botswana Training and Education Centre for Health and is working towards a master's at LSHCM in the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So over to your team, Chelsea. in Africa for the last 25 years and for the last eight years have been director of the Botswana Sexual and Reproductive Health Research Initiative. As part of their international strategy, the team at the FSRH contacted us in Botswana to collaborate on one of their new knowledge exchange initiatives. Nene and Tiro, two senior SRH providers in Botswana who took the ICK, and Helena, who is a doctor from the UK with an interest in SRH, who was working with us on the pilot last year, are joining me on this presentation. I'll hand over to them now to give you some more information about what we've done. 
Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, hi, everybody. As we've been hearing, the FSRH international strategy is composed of three areas and the ICK has been developed in line with the knowledge exchange STEM. The goal of the ICK is to develop and assess knowledge in SRH for clinicians working globally, particularly low and middle income countries. The course is based on FRH standards and guidelines and uses e-learning modules to cover over 30 topics, including reproductive anatomy, contraceptive methods and decision-making, STIs and early pregnancy. There's a final online assessment which candidates must pass in order to be awarded a certificate of completion. A really great additional benefit is that candidates are given membership to the FSRH, which includes access to online resources. That includes journals, webinars and guidelines. Our partnership with the FSRH began in 2018 when Pauline McLean came to Botswana from the UK for an attachment with our team. She interviewed directors from the Ministry of Health and Wellness and also clinicians to gauge interest in an international qualification and also to understand some potential challenges. Following this, the FSRH developed the ICK and came back to us in 2019 um, to support the pilot of the course. And that's what we'll present to you today. Just to give you some background about who we are, the Botswana Sexual and Reproductive Health Research Initiative, or BISHRI, is the umbrella organisation for our work. It's a partnership between multiple academic institutions, including the University of Botswana, and also organisations delivering clinical SRH care, such as the Botswana Ministry of Health and Wellness, and also others in the South African region, Southern African region. The Bishri team is made up of clinicians and academics who are all based in Botswana full time. The group primarily undertakes research, but is also involved in clinical care, teaching and training and advisory support to the Botswana Ministry of Health and Wellness, the South Africa Department of Health and international bodies such as the WHO. I'll just pass over to Nene now to tell you more about Botswana and our pilot. Hello everyone and thank you, Helena. I'm uh, Nene, SRH, SRHR provider. And I'd like to give you some information about the context that we work in as SRH providers in Botswana. The adult HIV prevalence of 23% is one of the highest in the world, with almost half of women of reproductive age living with HIV. 64% of women of reproductive age use modern methods of contraception, but there is dominance of condom use, with very few using long-acting reversible methods. Diagnostic testing for STI is not available, and therefore data on population prevalence is not known. But small studies in antenatal populations suggest a prevalence of around 10% for chlamydia and gonorrhea in pregnant women. Cervical cancer is one of the most cause of cancer death in Botswana women. And screening is available through pap smears, visual inspection with acetic acid, and more recently, HPV testing is being introduced. Despite increasing frequency of contraceptive use, 40 to 50% of pregnancies are unintended. And in Botswana, like in many countries, safe abortion is highly restricted and in reality, completely inaccessible. It is estimated that 21% of maternal mortality in Botswana is related to unsafe abortion. Healthcare is available free of charge to citizens in Botswana and sexual reproductive health care is led by the Department of SRH at the Ministry of Health and Wellness and is delivered almost exclusively by the nurses and midwives in primary care. There are no specialist medical or nursing qualifications in SRH, and there is only one specialist SRH clinic in the referral hospital. We have a group of experienced and highly skilled, motivated providers who are in regular contact via dedicated WhatsApp groups. We offer each other clinical support, and we discuss needs in the communities and developments in guidelines and research. We call ourselves the Family Planning Master Gurus. We first became involved in the ICK in October 2019. We were contacted by Chelsea to ask us if we would like to take part in the pilot. We were all SRH providers working in the capital city, Haboroni, and we comprised of four nurses, 
four nurse midwives, two doctors, and one healthcare assistant. We received login details to the e-learning website and a couple of weeks later, we had a face-to-face -face meeting with the BSRHI team to have a formal introduction and answer any questions. We had the option to either do the online learning at home or use the IT facilities at the BSHR offices. As we are completing the e-learning, we use the WhatsApp and email to ask questions and to send updates and feedback on the course. Six months later, five of us completed the e-learning and passed the online assessment. The graduation was more virtual than we had originally planned because of COVID restrictions, but we have now got certificates of completion of the ICK. Hello everyone, my name is Tiro. Overall candidates had a very, really positive experience of the ICK and found it useful, enjoyable and motivating. Here are some quotes from us, but in summary, the online platform was easy to use, clear and logical, and the context was well explained. Generally, the modules covered the essential topics in a good level of detail. The videos, case studies, scenarios, and mini pieces made the learning interactive and interesting. We really value having a certificate of completion to show evidence of engagement in education and to add to our continued medical uh, education portfolio. As part of the pilot, we were able to identify a lot of things that worked well, but we also discussed areas that could be improved. In the next few slides, we will talk about some of the suggestions we have made. In the initial version of the ICK, the epidemiological data presented was mostly for the UK, but as everyone will be aware, there are big differences in the patterns of disease and outcomes between the UK and the much of the world. So it was really important that the data in the course was relevant to the global audience. We just picked out a couple of examples to illustrate this. HIV prevalence is 23% in Botswana compared to 0.17% in the UK. And syphilis prevalence is 10%, 10 times higher than in Africa, higher in Africa compared to Europe. The graph on the right shows us the choice of contraceptive method uh, is very different in different parts of the world. For example, injectables shown in dark green make up a tiny portion of use in Europe, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, they are the most commonly used. Another issue is, is that because this was an F FSRH project, the recommendations were based on the UK MAC. Why the whole medical eligibility criteria is what is used throughout the world? While there are differences, they are broadly similar and therefore we have suggested that the decision, the discussions of the WHO MAC is included. There are a few specific topics that we thought need more discussions in the ICK. Firstly, the syndromic STI management is used in many parts of the world where STI testing is not available. Mm -hmm. Syndromic management is a very different way of approaching treatment, involving recognizing groups of symptoms and providing empirical treatment for the common cause. For example, in a woman presenting with vaginal discharge, the guidance is to provide treatment for all chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas Chikomanas and Candida without confirming diagnosis of any. Secondly, we have suggested including information about visual inspection with acetic acid in the module on cervical cancer screening. This is simple screening method. This simple screening method, it makes up the backbone of the screening here and uh, in most low and middle income countries. Thirdly, we suggested a module on HIV. Globally, HIV has a huge impact on sexual and reproductive health. In Botswana, an estimated 60% of the women seeking SRH are HIV positive, and presentations are commonly HIV related. Additionally, HIV medication 
may impact on contraceptive choices due to pharmacolo pharmacological interactions. A more complex area within SRH globally is abortion care. While we presume that the majority of providers in SRH might advocate for access to safe abortions, it is illegal or highly restricted in many parts of the world. The situation is often announced as in some settings. While abortion may not be available, post-abortion care is provided and acceptable. Providers and their communities' opinions will vary, and these factors will have an impact on how clinicians discuss and manage unintended pregnancies. We fully support inclusion of safe abortion in the ICK, as it is an essential component of high-quality comprehensive sexuality, sexual reproductive uh, health care. But it may be challenging for SRH leader to recommend a course that involves discussions of abortion that does not fit in their legal context. We have suggested a broader discussions around abortion care, emphasizing its importance for comprehensive sexual and reproductive health, but also acknowledging the social, cultural, and the ethical, as well as the legal factors that may come in play. So as the ICK continues to evolve, there are some more general things to consider. A couple of potential barriers to access for the ICK are reliable internet and IT and language. We were able to address the challenge of IT access by offering classroom-based sessions, but this may not be possible on a larger scale. Leading on from that, buy-in from international teams will be essential to facilitate engagement. And while the ICK doesn't intend to be a formal qualification, a really key benefit for clinicians will be certification of their further training for their CVs. And so it's really, really important to engage with SRH service delivery and training bodies, thought leaders and organisations working in the field to make them aware of the ICK so that they recognise it and celebrate it. And that will provide motivation for clinicians to take part. As a result of our pilot and other reflective work, the FSRH has been making really valuable changes to the ICK. And as it continues to evolve, we will need ongoing guidance from international teams to keep it relevant and accessible. It's great to hear that the ICK is already being incorporated into projects such as Leading Safer Choices. And partnerships with like-minded local and international agencies are a great opportunity to provide high quality integrated learning resources and to raise the profile of the ICK. With all of that in mind, we are acutely aware of the dynamics, both historical and current, that exist when a global north high income country like the UK is suggesting programs aimed at the global south and low and middle income countries in all of their diversity. As such, as the ICK evolves, we have the responsibility to be active in making the program relevant, inclusive, meaningful, and sensitive to diversity. Continuing to be reflective about its value is also something that we must do in an ongoing way. And this can only be done through open and continual dialogue with global partners and with the potential users of the training program. That said, actually, much of the basis of best practice in SRH is fairly universal. And therefore, there is a huge amount of potential for knowledge exchange in this area. Even more, there is a real desire to increase, increase the global recognition of the specialty. And having certification supports that. We hope that inclusion in the ICK and the and importantly, having access to conferences, webinars, and journals that come with completion of the ICK will spark the enthusiasm of SRH providers and encourage development of a more global SRH community. This is a quote from one of the SRH providers who completed the ICK, and we all believe that it summarizes things well. The ICK is undoubtedly on track to being a fantastic tool for international SRH. And we have really enjoyed being a process, a part of the process of piloting it here in Botswana. So thank you very much to the FSRH and the International Committee for involving us and for involving Botswana. And we're really looking forward to our continued work together. I just want to finish off by recognizing 
some of the fantastic people who have helped us along the way in this initiative. Pauline started things off in 2018. Rebecca provided some of the Botswana data for us and Laseho, Sifalani and Seho from the Department of SRH in the Botswana Ministry of Health and Wellness, whose ongoing support and partnership we couldn't do without. Thanks very much to all of them and to all of the participants in the presentation today. We look forward to taking any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chelsea and team. It's so important as we roll out these products as part of our international strategy that we do get the feedback, I think, from um, how it's been used, the positives, areas that we can improve on. So thank you for your really thoughtful insights into the ICK and how it's been and how it's been utilised in Botswana. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Jane Kavanagh. She is the Associate Professor and Medical Ethics Lead at UCL Medical School and a Sexual and Reproductive Health Specialty Doctor in London. She is Clinical Education Lead of the ARCOG's Making Abortion Safe Programme and a member of the ARCOG Abortion Task Force Group and the FSRH Essentials Working Group. She co-chairs Doctors for Choice UK and is co-founder of the UK charity Abortion Talk. Over to you, Jane. My name is Jane Kavanagh and I'm an Associate Professor of Medical Education at UCL Medical School, a Specialty Doctor in Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare in North London and the Clinical Education Lead for the RCOG's Making Abortion Safe programme. In this talk I'm going to give a brief overview of the Making Abortion Safe programme and then focus on aspects of the programme that involve FSRH. So this is a three year large anonymous donor funded program which began in April 2020 and will run until April 2023. The overarching aim of the program is to support healthcare professionals to address the barriers to safe abortion and or post abortion care. Towards the end of last year, we, we recruited 73 sexual and reproductive health rights champions from five focus countries, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Sudan and Zimbabwe. The programme was originally designed in partnership with FSRH through a series of collaborative workshops with key stakeholders from each organisation. It involves uh, three uh, main strands, professionalism, normalisation and leadership. The aim of the professionalism strand is to increase healthcare professionals access to educational resources on abortion care by producing an e-learning package and best practice papers on safe abortion and post abortion care. The aim of the normalisation strand is to increase healthcare professionals access to resources addressing abortion related stigma by producing an e-learning course on legal frameworks and harm reduction models of care and by conducting research on the impact of abortion related stigma on providers, which will feed into guidance on how to address this. Finally, the leadership strand aims to increase champions and other healthcare professionals support to advocate for safe abortion and or post abortion care by developing an advocacy training package. All of these resources will be open source and will also feed into the national advocacy strategies being developed by each focus country. Uh, the champions will benefit from access to both RCOG and FSRH educational material uh, and support through associate or affiliate membership. They've also been given the opportunity to complete the FSRH International Certificate of Knowledge, fully funded by the programme. Many of the champions have expressed a strong interest in this and we're glad to be able to offer it. I'll now give you a little more information about the programme work streams that FSRH are involved in. Starting off with the abortion care e-learning package, which is being co-designed with the champions in line with the Open Universities model for co-creating resources. We're aiming for 10 modules, the first eight of which align closely to the FSRH SSM learning requirements. The champions themselves were keen to have a module on special considerations in abortion care, for example, for young people and following rape. And I was keen to include a module on teaching healthcare students about ab abortion. Uh, as we know, this isn't something that always happens to a good standard, both in the UK and globally. And I strongly believe good quality education inspires conscientious commitment to abortion care and is also an important advocacy tool. 
Each module will consist of a core lesson, which will draw on current RCOG resources, as well as the University of uh, California's Innovating Education resources, and the champions are my own personal teaching material. Modules will have sections on information for women and pregnant people, um, global perspectives with local protocols, clinical scenarios, consultation videos, etc. And a certificate of completion will be issued to those who choose to participate in the assessment at the end of each module. Now, I'm very pleased to say that the post-abortion contraception module will have a link to the excellent FSRH contraceptive counselling online course. As you can see in the slide, we're currently at the start of the co-creation process and we'll be designing, reviewing and publishing three modules at a time, aiming for completion in the autumn. Moving on to the best practice papers work stream. Um, these are peer reviewed, easy to use, adaptable documents that set out the essential elements for evidence based abortion care. They're aimed at all clinicians providing abortion related care globally and are also useful for trainees and students, as well as advocates and policymakers. They were originally developed in 2015 by a team led by Anna Glazia and have been successfully adapted for use in various countries. I've been updating these papers with Sharon Cameron and we're currently peer review ready to hand over to the champions for adaptation to their country context. We'll also be working on writing two new best practice papers and are liaising with champions about what would be most useful for their countries. Some of the suggested topics uh, are listed on the slide. If the champions decide to go ahead with a paper on post-abortion contraception, and I very much hope they do, um, we'll be working with the FSRH Clinical Effective, uh, Effectiveness Unit in the summer to develop this. Okay, this work stream um, has two strands, uh, provider stigma study and guidance on provider support, uh, stigma and burnout. The research has two elements, a global survey followed by in-depth interviews in our five focus countries. The global survey will investigate the effects of stigma on abortion providers, uh, assess their attitudes on their work and on women and all people who have abortions, as well as exploring their awareness and interpretation of abortion law. The data will then feed into guidance on how to address abortion related stigma. We're hoping this will have significant impact being the first large scale study to investigate abortion related stigma experienced by healthcare professionals globally. We've had lots of interest from organisations wanting to be involved and are working with 15 partners who have signed up to disseminate the survey, in including FSRH. The survey will be rolled out next month to over 20,000 providers in over 40 countries and will start the interviews in July with the aim of publishing the guidance by the autumn. And finally, um, the work stream on safe abortion advocacy training. This will produce an advocacy training package that will support healthcare professionals to develop their advocacy work to improve access to safe abortion and post abortion care. It'll cover local, national and international advocacy and will aim to be globally applicable and will include case studies from across the world. Uh, faculty's Harry Walker will be peer reviewing the content, which will also be co badged with FSRH and published on the RCOG e learning platform. Our advocacy lead, Merrill, would love to receive examples of healthcare professionals engaging in advocacy to improve safe abortion access. So if you have any examples, please, um, please do get in touch and email me. I put my email address on the last slide. As well as participating in the work streams, each champion will work in their country group to develop their own national advocacy strategy, which will set out the goals and objectives to break down barriers to safe abortion care or post abortion care in their countries. The work stream outputs will be incorporated in these strategies on top of other activities needed to achieve national advocacy objectives. The RCOG is also in the early stages of developing its own international advocacy strategy on safe abortion, and we're currently speaking with different internal and external stakeholders and are keen to collaborate with FSRH on this. And to finish, one slide on other joint FSRH making abortion safe ventures. So we've worked together and co-badged various comms outputs, including our key messages on safe abortion and the Telegraph op-ed on the global GLAG rule by both RCOG and FSRH presidents. We're also running a co-badged course on abortion care essentials later this year with um, BSACP. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please do get in touch if you'd like any further information or to pass on any examples of abortion advocacy work. Thank you.
Thank you, Jane, for sharing um, insights into that hugely important piece of work that's going on at the moment uh, with, with ARCOG and partners. Our next speaker this evening is Professor Dame Leslie Regan, who I'm sure many of you have heard speak. I have many, many times, and so it's wonderful that she's able to join us this evening. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Leslie Regan is the Secretary General of FIGO. She's Chair of the Wellbeing of Women and member of the NHS Assembly. She was the 30th President of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists between 2016 and 2019, and only the second woman to be elected to this position and the first in 64 years. During her tenure as President, she co-chaired the National Women's Health Task Force with Jackie Doyle Price, MP who was then the Health Minister, and authored Better for Women, a hard-hitting ARCOG report which promotes a life course approach to the delivery of women's health services and shines a light on many historical taboo subjects such as period problems, pelvic pain, contraception, abortion, domestic violence, menopause and maternal mental health issues. She is the Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Imperial College London and consultant at St Mary's Hospital in London. Having graduated from the Royal Free Hospital of Medicine in London in 1980, Professor Regan pursued her training at Addenbrooke's Hospital Cambridge, where she first became enthused by clinical research, completing her MD on miscarriage. She went on to set up the world's largest recurrent miscarriage clinic at St Mary's Hospital in London. In 2015, she received a Doctorate of Science from the University College London for her contribution to women's health. In 2020, she was awarded a DBE for her services to women's health in the Queen's New Year's Honours List. And of course, she was honoured the FSRH Honorary Fellowship in 2020. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you for um, inviting me. I'm rather excited because it's the first time I've spoken to the FSRH as an honorary fellow. So I'm going to try and share my screen because I was asked to talk um, about um, the Better for Women report in a little bit more detail. And I just wanted to emphasize to you that this was all based on trying to adopt a life course approach to women's health and thinking about women and wrapping the services around them. So, um, as you said, I'm past president of the RCOG, where I had much fun and I'm so thrilled that the faculty moved to uh, the, new, um, the new building in Union Street. So on with the um, Better for Women report. So this gives me an opportunity to thank everyone who's in the, at the faculty for all the help that they gave me in producing this report. It was published in the last few weeks of my presidency in December 2019. And for those of you who attended the launch, at the House of Commons, it was wonderful. It was one of the last times I've ever been in a room with 300 people jammed in. It seems like a very, it seems like millennia ago now after this extraordinary year of COVID. But it really was trying to um, improve things and make it, things better for women. We toyed with the idea, and I know Asher and I talked about what we should call this report many, many times. And we wondered whether it should also have a strap line saying, better for women, better for less. Because one of the, re one of the realizations we had when we published this was that if you wrap the services around women and stop them making running around all the different services, you can actually provide them with much better care for less money. So perhaps it should be better for women and better for less. So what we tried to do is to um, base it on a life course approach, recognizing that it's actually quite easy to predict what women need. Um, and then we wanted to emphasize the importance of access to accurate education and information, making women part of the solution, because if you give them information, they tend to make better uh, decisions, to prevent and empower them rather than just be the disease intervention doctors that my generation were taught to be, um, and also to shine a much needed spotlight on the appalling fragmentation and access to services. So the primary recommendation in the executive summary was that we need to create an NHS-led women's health strategy. And I'm a little bit frustrated by the current Department of Health uh, and Social Care putting out yet another call for evidence, because I think we've done all that, but I shall bide my time and be patient and hope that by the end of this year, which will be two years after the Better for Women report, um, was launched that we'll have some uh, that we'll be able to move some of the recommendations forward because the 22 recommendations in this report are not rocket science they're common sense things that we can do to rejig our services to make it better for women 
because we know that if we do it for women, that we actually benefit everybody else in society because women are the linchpins of families. And of course, our specialties are looking after girls and women from cradle to grave. And we need to remember that as each decade passes, the health and wellness of that girl or woman in that decade impacts on the next decade of her health. So why are women's health strategy? Because um, I had to spend a lot of time talking to people like Jeremy Hunt and Matt Hancock about why we needed one. And they said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why do we need one? Well, 51% of the use case population is female. They make up 47% of our workforce and they do the vast majority of the unpaid caring. And we know that women's health is not receiving the attention it deserves. And we know that there are extraordinary variations, not just in access, but in quality of services across the UK. And at the time when we set up writing this report, women were experiencing health inequalities and outcomes that could be easily avoided. And I would argue would be um, not really uh, tolerated in many underdeveloped countries. So these are the two um, secretaries of state that I spent a lot of time going on about this. And they kept saying, well, what's your problem? We've got all this stuff. And they always used to point to the maternity reports, the maternity transformation program, the neonatal care bundle, da, 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 da. And there was one day when I think it was, well, it was with Jeremy Hunt, when he said it again, but I can't understand what you're worried about because we've got it all here. And I said, well, show me where it is, Mr. Hunt. And he said, here it is, maternity and neonatal care. And I just exploded and I said, well, that's the problem with you, Secretary of State. You still think to think that you're in Margaret Atwood's world of The Handmaiden's Tale, where women were just there to incubate babies and deliver them. There's a whole life course to support. Well, you can imagine it had a rather dramatic effect on him. And he then promised that we would have a, a women's health strategy. And then he disappeared off to the Foreign Office. I don't think the two things were um, uh, coincident, but... Um, Anyway, we managed to get the um, life course approach um, and the women's health strategy launched. And this was what we were trying to say in the report, that here's um, a graph of a woman's life from naught to 60 plus years. And that pregnancy care, although very important, is only going to be um, needed by four out of five women. But every woman is going to need menstrual health um, help or help with her periods. Most women you and I know will have 12 periods a year for 40 years of their life. This is a very common everyday occurrence and yet we don't talk about it. And they're going to need contraception uh, for those, those times as well because we average one to two babies uh, now per woman, not what my grandmother used to do. And of course the other thing that I think is most important in which this, this report highlighted was that it is an inevitability now that the women in this country will become menopausal because they're all, well, the vast majority of them are living into their early 50s. And yet my generation of doctors were told that the menopause was something that happened. Sometimes we were taught about giving people HRT or women HRT, but there was nothing to do with the quality of their lives after the age of 50. And as I said to many of those health ministers that we, I was talking to, you have to remember that I'm the first generation of woman who's going to live longer as a postmenopausal woman than I was reproductive. And although I'm not planning to live forever, I want to live well whilst I'm still alive. So that's a really important focus, which I don't think I'll have time to talk about tonight. But here's Jackie Doyle Price, um, who was a fantastic supporter um, of the Women's Health Task Force. And there is many of you, I've just looked at the, the names of the attendees who would really cave your time to us. And thank you so much for all of that time. We launched the, the, the Task Force on Women's Hour. I'm a great believer uh, at the time it was Jenny Murray and, um, and Jane Garvey who were, who were hosting Women's Hour and it sort of made it a bit bona fide. So that was November the 15th, 2018. Um, about a year and a, uh, 13 months, I should say, before um, the Better for Women report was published. And the task force priorities that we identified right at the beginning were all those issues across a woman's life course uh, where there really is not enough done for women. Unplanned pregnancy, contraception and sexual health, fertility, menopause, menstrual health, breaking taboos. I could go on and on and on, but I'm only going to speak for a, a short amount of time. But let's look at the menstrual health facts. We know that one in five women experience unusually heavy periods. It's one of the commonest reasons why women go to gynecology outpatients. Pelvic pain affects around one in six women. There's only two million women currently living with endometriosis. And it's shocking, isn't it, that the woman who has endometriosis, on average, it takes her seven years to write, reach a definitive diagnosis. That wouldn't happen if men had pelvic pain like this. They would get their diagnosis more quickly. I'm absolutely confident of that. 
around one in three women are going to develop fibroids in their lifetime. And depending on their age and their fertility wishes, they need to be managed in different ways. One in five women have polycystic ovaries. So these are really, really common problems. And yet we've got an extraordinary problems with taboos um, and understanding. 48% of girls in the UK embarrassed by their periods, four out of five girls feel too uncomfortable to discuss anything with their teachers at school. Half of the girls in our schools have missed days of school because of their periods, and that's before we even discuss period poverty. And then we think about menopause, as I said earlier, um, terribly important, the other end of the, the, the menstrual cycle, if you like, women feeling embarrassed, they have a lack of awareness that treatment's available, they feel they've got to endure the symptoms because they're told that they're their GP, often that they're natural, they're scared about HRT, many of them are on the internet buying unregulated products. And an enormous number of data that came out in this report about the numbers of women who were telling us that they had real problems dealing with the menopause and felt that they had no one to turn to who could help them. Let's go back to that extraordinary statistic of the 45% of pregnancies um, that are unplanned in the UK. Um, I remember the first time when I was telling Sally Davis, our previous CMO, about this, and she actually said to me, which country are you talking about? And I said, it's this country. Um, and about 33% of births are unplanned. Um, and that, of course, means that abortion rates for women are rising. Um, they're higher now than they've ever been since the 1967 Act. And they're increasing in women over between the ages of 35 and 45, not in young women. And when we asked those women why it was that they needed to have an abortion and why they found themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, the resounding response was, we couldn't access long-acting reversible contraception. We know as well that public health funding cuts have hit women's health disproportionately. And here are some of the horror figures that you can see um, in a variety of things. I'll just focus on one. 50% um, of women that we spoke to at the Better for Women uh, survey, which, looked, uh, which, which reached out to 4,000 women across the UK, said that they couldn't access sexually transmitted infection services locally. I mean, I'm sure for everybody on this webinar tonight, that's a horrifying figure, isn't it? One in two. Um, 32 local authorities closed their contraceptive services in 2016, 2017. These are just the infographics from the women, uh, the Better for Women report to share them with you. 25% of women said that they didn't have an invitation to attend their cervical screening. It seems extraordinary in a country that actually pioneered the first um, national cervical screening program. And already we're starting to see the numbers of projected cervical cancers starting to rise as a result of that. We know there's a big problem, as you mentioned, uh, with safeguarding women and violence. I mean, the figures have been particularly focused on recently with the Sarah Everard murder. And I think we've got to do a lot more, our, our, our college and our faculty, to try and address this because, of course, we are the clinicians that these women are most likely, if, if they survive their abuse, to turn to or to go to seek help for the problems that they're having. And then we're the most likely clinicians that they're going to disclose to. 34% of women didn't attend their last cervical smear test. And when we probed into that, it wasn't because they couldn't be bothered or that they felt even that it was going to be painful or embarrassing. It was because they couldn't access an appointment. They said that the clinics locally were closed um, and that they weren't able to get an appointment with the GP or the practice nurse. And remember that this report was published in December 2019, three months before the COVID lockdown. So can we imagine what it's done now? And of those women who are having problems getting pregnant in direct contrast to those who find themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, nearly two thirds said that they couldn't access fertility services locally and that they had to travel long distances. And for anyone who's experienced um, fertility treatments such as IVF will know that if you have to have a long commute to your clinic, it makes it a very emotional and difficult situation even worse. And then there was the access to emergency contraception, which I thought was so extraordinary. This was the secret shopper or the mystery shopper survey that we conduct that the um, that BPAS conducted in 2018 and um, found that um, many pharmacies insisted on seeing a negative pregnancy test or proof of age. And in many of the cases, the consultations were very poor and unprofessional. So even if you had had unprotected intercourse and you were trying to be sensible about it and try and prevent an unplanned pregnancy, going to the pharmacy to get emergency contraception over the counter was extremely difficult and obstacles were put in the way of girls and women. 
And I think that is extraordinary because you know better than any other uh, group of professionals that contraception is the single most cost effective intervention in healthcare. And we know that in developing countries, for example, um, the use of contraception has cut the number of maternal deaths by 40% over the past 20 years, simply by reducing the number of unintended pregnancies. And yet these are data for 2013, which show number of women in Britain of childbearing age, nearly 12 million, and commenting that 78% of these women require support with contraception uh, and or preconception at any one time. What did we find in the Better for Women report? Well, I don't need to tell you this because you already live it and breathe it in your day-to-day -day practice. Contraception has become the Cinderella service of women's health. Despite the fact it's so cost effective, it's so beneficial, it's nobody's business. And rather, we need to change this and make it everybody's business. And in particular, skilling up our colleagues um, in nursing, midwifery um, and, as, and in medicine uh, with the benefits and skills to uh, provide long acting reversible contraceptives in particular. And this, of course, is the commissioning diagram that uh, Asher always used to take me to, the fractured commissioning between the CCGs and NHS England and the local authorities, both doing a little bit, but because they don't have to pay for the outcomes of the pregnancies that happen when they don't provide uh, good contraceptive uh, services, then nobody's got an incentive to get it any better. I confess I sat on the Maternity Transformation Programme Board for three and a half years when I was president, and I never managed to persuade them that they had to use uh, take contraception, which is a point I'd like to come back to in a moment, because there are some good things that have come out of COVID um, and post delivery contraceptive pilot programmes may be one of them that we're all going to be very pleased about. Now, the whole thing about larks, of course, is not new. And back in 2014, when Sally Davis made her annual report for the CMO's report um, entitled The Health of the 51% Women, she drew attention to the number, very high number of unplanned births, and there are even higher number of unplanned pregnancies, and talked about the cost effectiveness of larks and the fact that they were 20 times more effective in preventing pregnancy than pills or barrier methods. And yet still, this is six, what, six, yeah, six seven years later, we're still trying to uh, fight um, to, to get them, get funding for these, um, not just the devices, but also the training to put them in. And it very much reminded me of um, the fact that at about the same time as Sally Davis and Ed Mullins and I were publishing that report, The Health of the 51%, I was running a program in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Western Cape of South Africa and in um, Tanzania, um, which was focused on postpartum family planning. And the, the, the concept there was that many women in those um, developing countries only saw a healthcare professional when they went to the maternity unit or the birthing center or even the birthing hut to deliver their baby. So that if we didn't provide them with contraception then and there, the moment that the baby had delivered and the placenta had been, uh, been removed, that we were missing an opportunity. And I remember saying as well to Hunt, um, Jeremy Hunt, it seems extraordinary that we can do this in the foothills of Kilimanjaro and underneath Tabletop Mountain, but I can't do it in Paddington or Brixton. What is the problem with this? Um, and I think it's very interesting that it's, again, it's taken a pandemic, and I'll come back to this in a moment, for us to be able to offer post-delivery contraception now to women. So one of the recommendations for Better for Women was that we do have to tackle this unplanned pregnancy rate. 45% of 800,000 maternities is an awful lot of pregnancies. And as I said earlier, the abortion rate is increasing in the older women, majority of whom have completed their families, have children, and are finding it difficult to access larks. And we've got to optimise birth spacing to prevent obstetric morbidity, because I think what many of us forget if we're not doing frontline obstetrics that is that intervals of greater than 12 months between pregnancies reduces all the complications, or put the other way around, shorter intervals increases every complication of pregnancy from early miscarriage to stillbirth. And complications affect two patients, the mother and the baby. And of course, at a time in the 21st century when there is a strong lens or spotlight on disadvantage and inequality, we've got to remember that it's disadvantaged and marginalized girls and women who are going to be most affected by these problems. So I just thought I would uh, shine a bit of a light on the Imperial 
um, group where I'm working, I work at St. Mary's and we have two or three maternity units. Um, the current post birth contraception pathway in Northwest London, about 29,000 women give birth per year in that catchment area. Um, what they're meant to do is go off and find their GP or the family planning centre discuss contraception. I don't need to say to this audience, you're saying what, which family planning centre, what are they? They've all been closed down. And then hopefully they will go on to decide when uh, or whether and with whom or how many times they're going to have another pregnancy. And so first of all, they're coping with a newborn baby and learning how to breastfeed. And then we've got to deal with the public health cuts that I mentioned earlier uh, um, in PHE and the new. And then we have a global pandemic that gets put all over the top of that patchy information about what they can access, poor experiences in the past, anecdotal information and pregnancy often isn't planned or considered at all. So we did a bit of work in Northwest London during 2020 and actually looked at the figures. And we found that 5% of the women giving birth within one year of a live born baby in the same maternity unit, that meant that the interpregnancy interval was less than three months. And another 2% of the women in Northwest London in 2020 had terminations of pregnancy because they'd given birth within a year. And again, the interpregnancy interval was less than three months. So when you don't have good information and then you take away the major source of post-delivery contraception, the result is disaster, as you can see here. So what we're offering them in the Imperial uh, hubs, and we've now got a pilot rolling out to Northwest London, is one of four options before they leave the birthing unit or the delivery suite, either an intrauterine device, a subdermal implant, six months of the progesterone only pill and a reminder call to go back after six months and get some more or progesterone injectables. And we tried to sell it to the women that the progesterone only pill and the injectables or the Depo Provera should be thought of as bridging contraception and that what we're really pushing are the intrauterine devices and the subdermal implants. So the aim is to try and get universal access to effective contraception for all women giving birth in England. And hopefully this pilot and the one in Manchester and there's one in Oxford um, that has had some success will allow us to change the lens. And you've probably seen slides like this before. Uh, you know, you could look at inequality. and What is equality? What is equity? But actually what we're really looking for is the bottom right hand corner, which is justice and trying to get that universal access um, for effective contraception for all women giving birth. But possibly in, in finishing, I should just mention that one of the other uh, interesting findings from the survey of those 4,000 women in that Better for Women report was that 48% of the women, half of them, felt that a one-stop shop or a clinic for all routine women's health services would really help them and improve their access to maintenance care. And many of them reiterated back to me what I've often said, you know, most of the time women are accessing the NHS and health services not because they're ill, but because they're trying to maintain their health and they're trying to be sensible and responsible. And we're not really giving, give, doing what they, we should be to, to help them do that. So let's try and build a world where we center um, the women and build the care around them. And I think that if we could in some ways over the next couple of years enact at least half of the recommendations from that Better for Women report, we go a long way to improving the healthcare for women and affecting the lives of our daughters and our sisters, uh, our granddaughters, I suppose I should say now, because I'm in that, 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 that group. Um, and I think it's really important that we think about this logistically. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me and I'm going to finish there, thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for that overview. The questions are coming in thick and fast, but what I'm going to say is we're going to leave the questions for now until the end. And I'm going to move on to our final speaker, who is Dr. Annabelle Suemimo, who is a SRH trainee and founder of the community-based organisation Decolonising Contraception. Her interests include addressing gender-based violence and improving SRH access for people of colour. She is a regular columnist for Galdem, and freelance journalist having written for The Independent and The Metro Online. She holds an undergraduate degree in medical anthropology, an MSc in sexual and reproductive health research and a diploma in tropical medicine and infectious diseases. And she's also a trustee for the MedAct charity. Decolonising Contraception is a community-based organisation formed by black and people of colour working within SRH who wish to address the colonial history of SRH in particular. 
the unethical er experimentation of, on black people of, of black people and people of color and the limited narratives of their experiences. Decolonizing contraception is about understanding how culture and history impact these populations and shape our experiences of healthcare. Annabelle firmly believes that healthcare should be part empowering people with knowledge to make informed choices about their bodies. She spends her spare time campaigning on reproductive justice. I can't believe she has any spare time with this. NHS cuts and improving healthcare of marginalized groups. And she shared with us this evening that she's writing a book about this as well. So watch this space. Annabelle, over to you. You know, pronoun she, her, founder of Decolonising Contraception and a community sexual reproductive health registrar in Leicester and the trainee representative for the International Committee. And I'm just going to be talking to you a bit today about decolonizing sexual and reproductive health. So before we start very rapidly, as I said, I sit on the International Committee, which is why I'm talking to you today. I'm founder of Decolonizing Contraception, a nonprofit community interest company, and I'm a writer and I also am a trustee for Medac Charity. So today I'm very rapidly going to go through discussing um, decolonizing um, sexual reproductive health care, which means understanding that feelings and experiences of contraception are not universal, um, how policy today has been shaped by history um, and examples of neocolonial practice within interventions and contraceptive policy, um, and think about how to use um, frameworks such as reproductive justice and decolonizing frameworks. So I'm not going to go through all of this because it's very detailed, but modern the modern history of contraception has kind of key milestones that we often think about, such as the development of the first intuterine devices, um, the establishment of Planned Parenthood cl clinics um, in the US by Margaret Sanger, um, and the development of the oral contra contraceptive pill. And often traditionally, we see contraception as quite a liberatory practice, which it has been in many ways, um, and has liberated many of us um, and enable people um, to plan their lives better. Um, however, this is not the full, full story within um, contraception. So when we think about decolonizing, um, Tiwa Smith, who is a Maori um, researcher um, in the US, wrote a book called Decolonizing Methodologies and very much thinks about the indigenous Maori perspective, but has done work that's very um, useful for a lot of people. And she said to decolonize is to acknowledge the often harmful role that colonization has played in distorting knowledge and restructuring our society. It asks how we may dismantle epistemologies derived through colonialism instead center the experience of indigenous populations. So we're not always talking about indigenous. In this country, we're talking about diaspora communities, people experience other forms of marginalization and looking at how historically policy may have been aimed at them um, and interventions may have um, been unjust. So when we look at contraception um, and the history behind that, what does that mean for us? So the legacy of family planning is deeply intertwined with the history of eugenics. So eugenics is the idea that we could improve the human species through selective breeding um, and was developed by Sir Francis Galton at University College London. And this was happening alongside um, um, the British, the expansion of the British Empire and um, the interest that people had in family planning was very much its use to be able to stop um, certain populations um, reproducing improvement of um, the human um, the human race. And in fact, um, some of the leading figures within um, that sector, Margaret Sanger and Mary Stokes, wrote avidly about eugenics and how family planning could assist with, with these efforts. So this is just a quote from um, um, a publication that um, Mary Stopes wrote in the Birth Control News um, in 1922, which just articulates um, that idea that, you know, we should be encouraging reproduction of, of some groups and, and not others to make a more productive society. 
So when we look at things also like the creation of the oral contraceptive pill, which was developed by um, Harvard scientists, the reason that it was developed in Puerto Rico with research from Puerto Rican women was very much because of the political climate in the US wouldn't allow for this. But um, there was also what was seen as a reproductive boom in Puerto Rico and poverty and um, a less knowledgeable population. So it was a good cohort or seen as a good cohort of people that could be experimented on that would ask a few questions um, about um, about the, the pill. And they weren't really informed as much about the side effects and things like that. So, again, we have to look at the history of how we've come by the knowledge that we have and how that makes um, different groups of people feel about about the tech, the reproductive technologies we have. Um, so today we have a lot of conversations about environment and sustainability and family planning being used um, to for those reasons. But in many people's minds, that's seen as family planning for population control. So it's still a way to eradicate certain populations that are seen as impoverished, um, don't necessarily have um, the the mental capacities or the the physical capabilities um, um, that that others have and um, to reduce overcrowding or even when we have interventions that are very much based in the global north work, um, working to reduce population global south people see that as trying to maintain kind of racial purity or minimize races that are seen as seen as inferior and this framing isn't without kind of the basis. So when we look at conversations about kind of overcrowding, overpopulation and trying to improve sustainability, um, the carbon footprint of one person in some in, in the global north often is, you know, the same sometimes as a family in the global south. Um, and so we have to have more conversations um, around that um, when we think about when we're having these conversations, we also need to be having conversations about what we can do um, in tandem also. When we look at the histories of individual reproductive, um, sorry, contraceptive methods, we also have to be mindful that some of them have a really tainted history. So if we take the legacy of the Nor plant in the US, which was approved in 1991, when it was rolled out, there were a lot of conversations um, and articles published about how that method could be used to um, reduce, you know, the underclass or particularly target certain communities. And given the history of the US, that often means poorer black communities um, were disproportionately being targeted to use nor plants. So um, the US has a very strong history of um, race-based sterilization programs. And instead of doing that, people saw this as an opportunity um, to, 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 to to use this um, as a kind of a temporary method or a more easily um, way to sterilize certain populations. So it has a very tainted history. Um, there's also a very tainted history with Depo Provera. Um, so this is just one example. There's, you know, there were lots of campaigns in the UK around Depo Provera as well for similar reasons. But in Zimbabwe, um, it was actually banned um, when the, the black majority government came into power because um, they felt that there was a history of it being misused on black farm workers. Um, to ensure that they didn't get pregnant and kind of maintain their pro productivity. Whereas, of course, some people would have been using it um, for their as part of their own decision making. Um, there was signs that it was being misused and that was the legacy um, in Zimbabwe. So in the UK, um, there's been a long history of um, racially marginalized populations um, stating that they feel that contraception is used as coercion and highlighting how um, the experiences that we see globally um, and how contraception is used happens on our own doorstep. So this quote is taken from a book that was written in the 1980s called Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain. And it has been a very important text in kind of understanding um, the, the lives of black women was one of the earliest texts written about this. And they said many paternal and apparently sympathetic doctors persuaded black women to accept an abortion or contraception she did not really want out of a concern to control our fertility. And such attitudes are reflected not only through our experiences here in Britain, but in our countries of origin, where myths about the need for population control are used as an excuse for unleashing mass sterilisation and birth control programmes on black and third world women, often as part of the West aid package. So 
this kind of summarizes that this has been a really long conversation that's been happening and it's not a new thing that people have had these feelings but it's only recently that people started to take note um, of this dynamic and understand that there is a need to address it and that contraception has been grossly misused. So when we say to decolonize and we're not talking about just um reflecting on our history, um, we're talking about how it impacts us today and developing um, a critical analysis of policy and interventions, thinking about who it affects, what's the overall objective, how it links to other issues more globally, and what is the local and um, political climate that is shaping, um, shaping these issues. So, we need to renew our approach to SRH, and this means that we need to include more voices and we can't have a single story um, approach to contraception. Um, typically, we've often thought about um, SRH and con contraception very much when we talk about choice and a rights-based approach, meaning um, ensuring individual decision-making, free from coercion, without judgment, fully informed, and making sure a range of options are, in, uh, are available. This is all very important, and we are trying to maintain autonomy, and these are things that we would want in an ideal world. However, we have to think more broadly that it isn't just about um, autonomy because even what does what does autonomy mean we have to think about um, the wider social inequalities both local and globally that exist that mean that there are greater choices in one area than another area um, that some way um, faces stockouts and other places don't um, and a, the one woman can afford to have a child and another can't um, and why those inequalities exist um, that lead the people to make their choices so that's why reproductive justice frameworks have been established and that's what it's trying to address um, thinking of the wider social inequalities and structural inequalities that exist that shape our decision making process so um, I welcome um, any questions that you have and hope this has provided a very quick overview of some of the things that um, we work on and we're working towards. Thank you, Annabelle. If I could ask our speakers uh, to put their cameras back on so that we can see you all. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes uh, left for questions. And so I've been compiling some of the key questions. We'll probably have about time for one question each. So um, my first question is to you, Nikki. Is the FSRH involved with sexual health education in any other countries other than Botswana, which is what we heard about this evening? Thank you, Helen. Well, yes, we do. I mean, we are obviously involved in the um, RCOG project uh, in, in those countries. Um, but we don't have any specific links. Um, we have our um, uh, international certificate of knowledge, which is available to anybody that wants it, and our contraceptive counselling, which is is uh, used by you know many countries. Uh, but we are really looking to uh, develop more partnerships uh, with people, um, and that's you know that's one of the points of our, our international strategy. Lovely. And if anybody's interested, can they get in touch with you uh, by email, perhaps, Nikki? Absolutely, yes, yes, my emails, um, I'll leave it on the chat. Lovely. Uh, the next question is to, to you, Chelsea. Um, thank you to you and your team for presenting um, around the use of the ICK. The question is from your experience, obviously outside the UK, you've got many years working uh, in Africa. What do you think we could learn most in terms of women's health? Oh, hi, sorry, Helen, I was on, on mute. Um, that is a huge question, Helen. <laughs> um, and uh, let, let me give a, a, take a second or two to think about how to respond. I mean, I think that I think one of one of the one of the things that we mentioned in our presentation is that a lot of I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, what we're trying to achieve in SRH and sort of best practice and aspirations are actually fairly universal and can be achieved in many different settings. So I think that there's often this, sometimes a tendency to think that what we can achieve in a UK type setting might be vastly different from what we can achieve in another setting in terms of the services that can be developed, the quality of service, um, the woman-centeredness that can be achieved. And I, I think what, for, speaking from my 
personal experience as a clinician in both settings and from programmatic experience, I think it's really important to recognize that what we should aspire to achieve and the standards that we should set can and should be the same in a diversity of contexts. Mm. So that is a very uh, perhaps non-specific answer to a very big question, but I think that's something that's often forgotten. And I think we need to hold ourselves as practitioners and program managers and policymakers to similar standards wherever we're working. Mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Jane, over to you. Obviously, um, the, the projects that you're that you're leading in terms of, in terms of making abortion safe. Are there any key challenges in your experience so far that perhaps you can uh, share with us and perhaps how you've overcome those? Muted. Classic. Uh, sorry, just just to point out that I, I'm not actually leading the project. I'm the clinical education lead, but we have a, an excellent project manager called um, Nia Shepherd, who's who's actually doing the leading. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to say that our biggest challenge is has been coordinating all the champions because we aim to recruit 40, but we ended up recruiting 73 because we had such oh. impressive um, applications. So it's, it's quite challenging to sort of coordinate 73 people in five different countries to, to actually input and to come up with a product that everyone's happy mm. with. Mm. Um, but we, as I said in my talk, we're trying to co-create everything, which is, is also a challenge rather than just present people with, with things. But we're, we're working things out as we go along. And I think we find a very productive way of working over teams, um, which of course now everyone's used to working virtually. So that's been an advantage for us. Um, whereas it would have been a struggle if people weren't mm. used to using Teams. And so, yes. so we're, we're, we're on track for, for all our outputs and, and it's very exciting and it's a pleasure working with, uh, with the champions and they're, they're, ama they're, they're true heroes, they're amazing. Fantastic, thank you. And I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more as that develops as well. We can get some, some feedback from you and the team. So that's, that's lo lovely, thank you. So um, Leslie, if I could pose the next question to you, if that's, if that's okay. So there's so much in the Better for Women report uh, that is relevant to an international audience as well. I wonder, uh, do you feel that there is an appetite for that report and how it can be utilised globally as well? Did you find that at all? Well, very much so. Um, and recognising what the other speakers were going to talk about, I didn't talk about, for example, the other thing that's happened is thanks to COVID, which is telemedicine abortion. And that, of course, is applicable to almost every country in the world. Um, I've spent more time doing webinars to Southeast Asia and South America in the last year um, because they're all wanting to use the telemedicine abortion recipe that's worked so well in the UK. Um, so I'm a real believer in the fact that this, this business about how global health is a two way street really mm. is not just a saying, it really matters. And as I was trying to say, when I was running the leading safe choices program in, in the Western Cape and in Tanzania, we couldn't do it in Paddington. Um, and yet we, we've actually adopted now in the Imperial Group in Northwest London, just during the pandemic, and I'm trying to make sure it stays now post pandemic or whatever the new world is going to look like. Yeah. We're just using the same things that we were using in global health work in developing countries some years ago. So mm. I think it's very much a two, we've, everybody learns from it. Um, so it's not that we're, you know, we're, we're helping, in quotes, the developing world to do better. I think they're helping us to do better. And I think one of the problems with developed health services is that they frequently get very complacent. Um, and we all need to remember that, you know, getting complacent usually means that women get disadvantaged. So mm. I think it's been a real, learning um, episode and particularly this last year as to how badly women have done um, as a result of the, of, of the pandemic and the lockdown and also the great things that have come out of it. So for example, you know, post-delivery contraception models that quite a few places in, uh, are now trying to introduce or make routine practice and the telemedicine abortion, which I know we all are desperate to ensure becomes not a special measure, but a reality of life going mm. forward. Yes, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Annabelle, final question to you. So where do we hope women's health will be in about 10 years time? Uh, thank you. Massive question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming with all guns this evening. There's the big ones. <laughs> um, 
So I think a few things, something I'm really passionate about is research. So I think also we've seen recently in recent years around um, the the Pope rule around the pill and even recently around clots and the pill and AstraZeneca that um, people using contraception are less and less willing to accept not having all the information and the, and the facts. And I think that's really the way it should be. And I think when we look at SRH as a whole, our level of evidence and the research that happens around SRH is not um, as well funded. Um, and I have lots of reasons why I think that is because of the population, of course, that it affects. Um, then if you look at some, some other parts of um, medicine, so I feel that hopefully over the next decade, um, research and research groups will be better funded because it seems like we have a lot of methods, but actually we don't. And when we think about globally and we think about how um, we store medicines and stockouts and transporting, we all, always kind of position things definitely from um, a high income context. And that's where a lot of um, things are developed from. So I think there's a lot to be done about research. I think there's also much, we've a lot of this conversation centered around autonomy. And I think there's a lot to be said about people wanting more self-management. Um, and I think we have to be careful around how we shape self-management because it can also be used to um, suggest that we don't put in resources because patients can manage themselves. But from an autonomy point of view, people want methods where they feel like they can remove them and put them in themselves, um, but last a long time. Um, so things like Sanopress are really important and they're also really important in other um, outside of the outside of the UK um, and are easier to store. So I think um, in 10 years, I think hopefully more methods, um, methods where people feel that they have can maintain their own autonomy over themselves and then um, hopefully access because again similar to research I feel that people are slightly um, exhausted now in terms of the discrepancy that we have in the system around SRH because of the demographic that access SRH compared to some other services so I could go on for ages but just as an overview I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Annabelle. And thank you to all our speakers for participating in this evening's event, uh, the launch of the International FSRH International Strategy. If you're interested in more information, please go onto the website. This evening's uh, talks will be recorded and available to us uh, on the faculty website. If you're interested in getting more information, please uh, email us and we can send you out more information. And as we've said in the chat, Chelsea is very happy to feed back some specific information about, about Botswana and her experience. So I feel like we've ended on a really positive note. And um, this is a really exciting phase for the faculty, I feel, um, as we look more globally, internationally in how to support uh, equality in moving forward women's sexual and reproductive health care. So thank you once again and have a good evening. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.